Welcome to the Expat Empire Podcast, the podcast where you can hear from expats around the world and learn how you can join them. Hey guys, before we get to the interview, I want to remind you that we're offering free 30-minute consulting calls to anyone interested in moving abroad. Whether you're thinking about retiring somewhere warm, starting the next chapter of your international career, or even becoming a digital nomad, we're ready to help you think through the next steps in your journey. Send us a message at expatempire.com and schedule a call today. With that said, let's start the conversation. Hey Kathleen, thanks so much for joining us today on the Expat Empire podcast. Hey, David. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was great to connect recently and really love what you've been able to do here in Portugal. And of course, your experience traveling around the world as a digital nomad. So really excited to jump in the, into that conversation today and share it with all of our listeners as well. Likewise. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so as a good place, I think, for us to start, if you could just give us the highlights of your adventures so far. So where are you originally from, where around the world you've traveled to or lived in so far? And of course, where you are right now, that would be great. Oh, that's a long one. Okay, so <laughs> I was orig- I was born in California, Southern California. Uh, but when I was five years old, my family moved to Manila, Philippines, which is where we're originally from. So I pretty much grew up there. Um, and then after university, I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so that's the most recent, I guess, like home base that I've had. Um, my now husband and I were there for for about five years. And then in 2018, we sold all our things, decided to do the whole digital nomad thing. So we were traveling all around until we finally settled down here in Lisbon, Portugal, which is where I'm calling from today. Awesome. Yeah, that takes us through a lot of adventures there. And it's interesting that you said uh, that you kind of grew up, I think you said from around five years old in the Philippines. And so, um, you know, how how was that experience coming from? I mean, obviously, you were quite young, so I'm sure some of it's a bit spotty in your memory. But in terms of, you know, making that transition and then furthermore, you know, how did you get the opportunity or, or make the decision then to move to the San Francisco Bay Area after your university years? Yeah, absolutely. Well, transitioning as a kid, yeah, as you said, like there's there's not too much say that I had in <laughs> moving at five. Um, although I do remember it was really challenging uh, learning the language. But as a as a kid, like you adapt really quickly, so that was that was really good. Um, I decided to after college, um, I decided to move to the Bay Area mostly to experience like independence and just like living on my own. Um, so. That's really what what pushed me to make the move. Um, we had gone to the state, mostly to California, actually, when I was younger, like as a teenager for vacations and stuff. But it was cool to be able to kind of like li- experience living there as an adult. Hmm. So did you go there with a job or how did you actually make that initial transition after university? Um, ooh, that was a really interesting one. So my original plan um, in university was actually to go to law school after college. And that was kind of like the grand plan since high school. Um, a lot of it was like had to do with like family expectations and all that. Um, ultimately, it got to the point where I like applied for law school, got into law school, was supposed to make the reservation for my slot. And I told my family, like, I can't do it. I really can't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so at that point, it was like, what, two months before graduation, everyone had things lined up. I clearly didn't because I was mm-hmm. supposed to go to law school. And so I was at that crossroad where I was like, well, um, since I don't have anything lined up, I might as well like take the opportunity to see what else is out there. And I had visited San Francisco my junior year and it attended a tech entrepreneurship conference. I was like, oh, tech could be interesting. Like that's something that's like completely outside the realm of possibilities that I was initially thinking about. But since I don't have anything lined up, we might as well give it a try. And so mm-hmm. that's how I ended up in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. And what kind of work were you doing there originally? How did you get your start? Yeah. So I started out in the education technology space as a marketing intern. Um, And then kind of event, it was, yeah, I started as a marketing intern and ended up doing a lot of like marketing collateral, even though my background isn't really in design, but that's kind of like Mm -hmm. how I got into it and got really interested in it. And then eventually I was like, Ooh, design is really fun. I really enjoy doing it. I don't have any like technical training in it, um, but was able to get a mentorship from 
the des- like one of the designers in the company. So I ended up doing like a lot more design as a marketer and then eventually transitioned over to the design team. So I was then mm-hmm. doing product design like UX, UI for that same company. Nice. And so uh, I believe after that, you had an experience of just deciding to essentially start your own business, I suppose, with your now husband. I'd love to hear the story about that. And of course, the, you know, uh, where the idea came from, how you made it happen, how you got the courage to go out there and start your own entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, totally. So I forget the year. When was that? But at some point, like after working at that company for a few years, um, I do come from a family of entrepreneurs. So that has something that's something that's been in the back of my head and something that I've always wanted to try. And then there was a time when my husband and I had an idea that we wanted to work on together. And so it was kind of like a, you know, I wouldn't say spur of the moment, but it was kind of like, it was, it was a long time coming and it was just like, okay, maybe you just, we just had to like take the leap. Um, so yeah, we were actually working on a different idea. It's not design stack, which ended up being kind of like the main business that we ran um, for a few years. But basically, we, we wanted to work on a digital marketing boot camp. Um, so that's the idea that we got started with. We both quit our jobs. We were working on it. It didn't end up quite working out how we expected. And so like six months later, we were burning our savings in the Bay Area, which is not... Mm-hmm. <laughs> this place to live. Um, but we really enjoyed like the freedom and autonomy that came with running your own business. So we were like, how can we continue doing this? Like, you know, we weren't surprised that our first idea didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just wanted to kind of like keep trying. So then we figured like, you know, it would be really hard to balance starting your own business with having a full-time job. So how can we kind of like make money to support ourselves while we try and give this thing another shot? And so it really did come down to like, what skills do we have that we can make money from? Um, and I was a designer. So I was, so one of the ideas was like, oh, why don't we try to get web design clients? Mm. Um, so yeah, we basically got started by asking some friends if we could build websites for them, like, you know, friends who like needed a portfolio or friends who had a business. And that's how we initially got started. And then once we had a portfolio, then we literally, we were really lucky, I'd say, to get initial success on Upwork and get customers there. Mm -hmm. And then it Mm -hmm. kind of just took off from there. Do you have any tips for people to get started on a platform like Upwork? I mean, maybe it's different today than when you started, uh, you know, but these these platforms can be challenging, I think, to start out. At least that's the sense I get. So if you have any thoughts about maybe how you were able to really stand out from the crowd, even when it's, you know, uh, or I should say, especially when it's this global uh, you know, uh-huh. marketplace, right? Um, it would be great just to hear your thoughts. Yeah, especially on something like web design. I th- one thing that we did was we were pretty specific. So we... Mm-hmm. Start, we found a platform called Squarespace, which is now really popular, but at the time, I think, was like still in its like, not early phases, but it wasn't as popular. But basically, we specialize. I think my, my, my tip for people who are trying to get started on a, on a platform is to be very specific. Um, mm-hmm. So for us, it was like, oh, you know, like we build Squarespace websites. And so that's a differentiator already. Like we didn't build on any other platforms but Squarespace. Mm-hmm. Um, so that really helped us. And then eventually, I would say that like, after doing that for a few months, a year, I felt like we weren't even niche enough um, mm-hmm. to later then mm-hmm. find out that there are other people who are like, oh, I do Squarespace websites for dog trainers or like I do right. Squarespace websites for like, you know, specific types of restaurants. Um, and so I think like just I think that helps with like recall. Um, we eventually became mm-hmm. known as like expert Squarespace designers, but very like broad, like it was pretty broad. Um, we eventually mm-hmm. kind of like narrowed down into professional services. Um, but yeah, I guess that would be my tip. Like it's easier to like start start niche and then expand out. Um, and it helps you kind of like establish a name or become memorable in a way. Did you find that you really loved the work or was it more a mix of, you know, obviously you were fine with it on some level, but it obviously also gave you that lifestyle that you were looking for as well. So I'm curious on how you, you know, thought about that or balanced your Mm -hmm. uh, ambitions as an entrepreneur uh, relative to the lifestyle that you were trying to develop. Totally. I ended up loving it. Um, Yeah. When we first started, we were like, oh, this is like going to be temporary. It's going to give us a source of income while we figure out what's next. But then it actually ended up, we ended up investing in the business, building Mm -hmm. up the systems, um, investing in like the client experience and how we handled all our projects. Um, It was really fun. Um, I would say like the 
what like one thing that we really enjoyed about um, creating Design Stack was like productizing the services, which mm-hmm. we felt was like pretty different in the space, like having like set packages, being very like transparent about pricing, um, doing a lot of our work asynchronously while I felt Mm. like a lot of other designers would do like feedback calls for like every single milestone. So Mm. we kind of like played around with those things. Um, Mm. And so, yeah, I guess design stack went from like, you know, a side thing, source of income while we try out other ideas to like the main business Mm. that we worked on for, um, it ended up being about five years. So we were like, it also does come with, you know, like, I guess on the flip side of that, while we were trying to grow the business, it was also challenging. Um, I think with a lot of like creative services it is pretty challenging to scale. Um, mm-hmm. I was like our main design. Well, I've always been our main designer and it was really hard to like mm-hmm. um, grow the team. We were always kind of like caught in the middle between like, you know, growing like a big agency versus like being able to, um, figure out other ways <laughs> that were that, that that were more scalable in a way. Um, we ultimately decided for, uh, I guess, like, when was that? Maybe at around year three, we decided that we would keep Design Stack as like a business between the two of us. And mm-hmm. it became like our, then we were like, oh, let's use Design Stack and experiment with other ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's kind of led to a few other projects, Porter <laughs> being one of them. <laughs> Okay, great, great. So, uh, of course, you're in this scenario now where you're able to make your full time incomes from Design Stack, and uh, you know you're, I guess, still there in the San Francisco Bay Area. But of course, you decided to become digital nomads and start that experience. So, where did that idea come from, and how did you make your first steps? Yeah. So after running the business for about a year, we realized that we never met with any of our clients. Uh, we we worked with mostly U.S. based clients, a lot of them actually from California. Um, but everything was managed remotely. And so, yeah, after doing that for a year, we were like, oh, it would be really fun if we could do the whole like travel and work thing. Um, at the time, it wasn't that popular. I think it was actually like quite weird that we were doing this. A lot of our friends mm-hmm. from, from the Bay were like, mm, OK, well, that sounds kind of cool for you. Uh, mm-hmm. right. <laughs> so and I mean, we were really excited about it. So we just decided to to take the leap. Um, and so, yeah, we were like, there's nothing really holding, you know, like tying us down to the Bay area. We were both really curious about living abroad. Um, and then we had the, the means to do so. So Mm -hmm. we figured we should give it a shot. Do do you think that that interest in trying to, you know, live abroad, as you said, also came from your international experiences across different countries growing up or was there, you know, was it just purely something as simple as well, there's a lot of interesting cities and countries out there, let's go see them from almost more of a travel mindset or was there just, you know, what did you find to be ultimately your main motivation to make that leap when the people around you, a lot of them are giving you a strange look, right? (laughs) Totally, totally. I think a lot of it did come from like having moved from Manila to California after graduation. There's so much that you learn from like just being in a new environment and being thrown out of your comfort zone that I was really curious to like put like, you know, do that, do that more. Um, California was becoming comfortable. You know, we had like amazing friends. It's a great place. Um, but we, I, I was personally kind of like itching for like that next like adventure mm-hmm. and like new challenges. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. So you set off on your way and where do you decide to go to first? How do you even think about structuring a trip like that in the absence of, well, real structure, let's say. So how, <laughs> how do you think about where to go and how long to spend in each of those places? Totally. So we started just by listing out all the cities that we wanted to experience living in. And of course, that was like a really long (laughs) list. Uh, But we initially scoped out our trip to one year. So we were like, okay, maybe, you know, we can plan for a year. Um, Let's shortlist the cities that, you know, like both it was Richard and I. So then we were like, okay, what are cities you like? What are cities I like? And then let's like kind of like find the commonalities here and then do like a, a check to make sure that those cities have good internet, which is like the mm. one thing that we needed to run our business remotely. Mm. Um, right. And then that's kind of how, that's kind of how we ended up coming with a list. We had planned originally, I'm like a really big planner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> initially we were like, oh, let's just start with one city and then see how it goes. But of course, like before we left, we already had like the first three cities planned. Um, right. It was like a, a city a month. We kind of had like the top places that we 
individually wanted to experience. Like I personally really wanted to li experience living in Tokyo. And then Richard really wanted to experience Berlin in the summertime mm -hmm. after having spent mm -hmm. a brutal winter there. Um, so right. those are kind of like two top cities um, on the list. And then we kind of just like, uh, but our first destination was like Chiang Mai. And then based on like people's recommendations, it kind of ended up becoming pretty fluid. Okay, sounds good. And glad to hear that Tokyo and Berlin were top of the list for you guys because, of course, I spent some time in those cities as well. So um, definitely good spots to go to. Mm -hmm. But as far as your trip overall, then how did you uh, also manage your, your business? Because as you said, you decided maybe year three to just keep it between the two of you. And at the same time, you know, while that gives you that full ownership and control, you're also, I guess it's a month per city, so it's not like you're moving every couple of days. But um, mm -hmm. I can imagine, you know, balancing that would be quite different from having that home base in San Francisco. So how did you make that adjustment? Totally, totally. Luckily, I'd say that like with our business, we had set things up such that we operated pretty like asynchronously like we didn't have too many calls a lot of the things were managed on like google docs and email which was good i think that while we were traveling that pushed us to be even like better about it mm. um, because when you're in asia and you have like a 12 15 hour time difference with a client mm. you can't just, it, it's incon it's highly inconvenient mostly for me um to hop on a call like late at night um, so that was one adjustment. And then I think what we found pretty quickly was after about eight months of hopping around like one new city every mm. month, we ultimately decided to slow it down our second year. Um, mm. Because I think as a tr like prior to starting, we were like a month is a really long time. Like when you compare it to going on vacation somewhere, you're like, right. that's like more than enough time. But when you're actually trying to like live, work, experience a place, figure out like all the things um one month is actually really short you're kind of like mm -hmm. adjusting in like you know just adjusting to the new place and then next thing you know you're you're needing to plan for the next destination mm -hmm. um so our second year we ended up slowing down our pace to about two to three months at a time per city and that made it a lot more manageable and sustainable mm -hmm. How did you manage your accommodation during that time? I mean, maybe it was as simple as finding some more in Airbnb, but if you need to find a place for a month, two months, three months, mm -hmm. um, and at those usually inflated prices, I can imagine it gets more pricey. You know, maybe your cost of living overall is lower, but if you have any tips on how, or, or experiences related to that to find maybe the right spaces that also had good workspaces for you, or if you use co-working spaces and so on, it'd be great to hear about that. Yeah, yeah. So we, mo I did that. We mostly used Airbnbs, um, but in cities that were more expensive, let's say like in Taipei, um, we actually experimented with co living, which was also, which is very interesting, where you basically like have your own space, but then there's dedicated like common areas and. Some kind, you know, that space had like limited workspace, so you did have the option of like working in the common area. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of challenging. I would say we got an Airbnb in Tokyo, and it was like the most expensive we've paid in accommodations by mm. far throughout that whole trip. Um, but yeah, I guess in terms of finding accommodations, like searching in advance is helpful. And then one thing that I learned is that you can actually negotiate on Airbnb. Mm. Um, so mm. when you're staying in places for for a month or so, um, owners are are likely to give discounts because mm. you know you basically secure that whole month for them. Um, so we found some success in that and have been able to save a couple, you know, like some amounts here and there. Yeah, no, that's a good tip. Uh, definitely something I like to share with people as well, because that's also come in handy for us. Um, so you were, you know, doing the digital nomad life a month, a city, then slowing it down a bit. And then it sounds like at some point you've decided to settle down, at least for the time being there in Portugal. So what was the what was your thought process around you know, picking Portugal, but also to find a place to make a home base as opposed to just continuing this maybe slow travel lifestyle for the next few years? Yeah, totally. So coming up on our third year, we, you know, we were still really enjoying the traveling, but we wanted to find more of a home base where we could stay for more than the three months that typically comes like standard with a tourist visa. Um, we were actually like kind of deciding between going back to the States potentially um, or finding another place abroad. Um, we had shortlisted some cities in the U.S., 
but we weren't like too crazy about any of them. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. we were literally, there, <laughs> this was like September, 2019, around that time where we were like just researching, like where can Americans stay <laughs> in the world um, for more than six months? A lot of what came up, like, I guess like previously we had seen a lot of options for retirement visas, like mm-hmm. in Thailand, um, but there's typically an age minimum. And so mm-hmm. anyway, fast forward, yeah, in September, 2019, we were doing some research and then we came across the Portugal D7 visa. And the biggest thing that stood out to us was that, was that there was no minimum age requirement. And so mm-hmm. we're like, ooh, this seems like a like a really good option. Um, we could use the income from our web design business because basically the main requirement is that you're able to support yourself um, with income coming from outside of Portugal. It would be a great home base to explore more of Europe because as an American tourist, you know, you're only allowed to spend like three months every six months in the Schengen area. So our mm-hmm. exp- like our time in Europe has been quite limited. And then there was also path to citizenship or permanent residency, which was really good. And so we were like, everything sounds great. We should just give it a try. Um, so it was actually like a pretty quick decision. I mean, we had spent a month in Porto, our first month of doing the digital nomad thing. So we knew we liked it. Um, we hadn't mm-hmm. visited Liz been before. Um, Richard had a college friend who recently moved there. So we were like, oh, you know, at least we have like a friend that we know in Portugal. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, that's kind of like all those things combined. We were like, oh, we should just give it a try. Um, Let's apply for the visa. It's pretty straightforward. Um, And then we'll just try it out for a year, see how we like it. Um, And then we can just decide whether we want to renew or not. And so we submitted our application January 2020 and then ended up in Portugal in February. (laughs) Where did you submit the application? Um, In BFS, Washington, D.C. Okay, so you were back in the U.S. for a bit then to make the move Mm -hmm. before you made the move? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. And so how did you then decide on Lisbon, I guess? I mean, of course, you said you had a friend there, but given that you had experienced Porto, for example, but hadn't spent uh, too much time there exploring Lisbon, how did you decide that that would become your, your new home base? Yeah. So the initial stay in Lisbon was actually because as part of the visa application, we needed a com- proof of accommodations in Portugal. And right. because our friend had an apartment here, um, he actually did the golden visa and purchased a place. And so he had two bedrooms and he was like, oh, you guys can mm-hmm. just rent a room for me. And so we were like, oh, that's perfect. You know, it's kind of like a soft landing, living with a friend in a new city. We can meet the accommodations requirement for the mm-hmm. visa. So that's kind of how we ended up in Lisbon. Nice. And so, of course, uh, it goes without saying that soon after that, uh, the pandemic hit. And so I'd be curious <laughs> to hear your perspective on what it was like to be brand new in a country right around uh, the time that that happened. Of course, in my case, we moved in November 2019. So we, we had a couple more months on you, but uh, kind of went through, I'm sure, a lot of the same challenges. So would love to hear your perspective on it. For sure. Yeah. So we arrived February 2020 and having traveled for the past two months <laughs> we were so excited to have some semblance of a home base that when we arrived in lisbon we were basically like home bodies for the first two weeks um, un- you know like unknowingly that like two weeks later everything would shut down mm-hmm. um so yeah i guess our experience of portugal pre-covid has been quite limited um the shutdown was really interesting. We were fortunate to live with a friend. Um, so mm. that was quite fun to just kind of like have a di- company, additional company, like Richard and I had each other, which was great. But then we had like a third friend that we could like cook with and mainly cook with. <laughs> I'd say that yeah. was like <laughs> our main activity <laughs> during, during right. the lockdown. Um, so yeah, I think our experience of Lisbon has been very interesting so far. We spent the first five months in Lisbon, but then after that we were like, you know, why don't we just take this opportunity to see more of the country? Because there wasn't there wasn't really much going on anywhere. Um, mm-hmm. So we actually ended up living in Porto for a little bit and then doing like a road trip down to the Algarve. We spent some time in the Algarve. We spent some time in the Silver Coast, back to Porto, down to Lisbon. We were kind of like nomadic within Portugal mm-hmm. for those first two years. And it's only recently that we decided to settle in Lisbon. Um, mm-hmm. So we actually literally just signed a a long-term lease last month. Okay, nice. So you had all of those experiences around Portugal. What was it about Lisbon that made you decide that that was the spot that you wanted to get this long-term contract in? Yeah. Um, So Lisbon, I think it's because it's mainly because everyone, like a lot of people come through Lisbon. Uh, (laughs) So it's, 
convenient for, you know, friends, family who want to visit. Um, also with Border, which we're running now, it was just like convenient to, to be here. And then Lisbon's a great city. I'd say that like Porto, which I know you are, which is where you're at, has a very special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, so that would have been our our second pick. <laughs> mm, okay, good to hear. Um, so yeah, of course, we'd love to just jump into the new business that or maybe not so new anymore, but the business that you have here in Portugal, um, yeah. border and helping people to be able to actually make their moves to Portugal. So you've done a lot of great stuff with that. If you could just walk us through, of course, what the company is, how you started it and how it's grown over the last couple of years, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So we started Border last year around this time. Um, it came out as a result of our own personal experience. So back when we applied for our D7 visa, we did not need to, we only needed to show um, proof of NIF and bank account once we were in Portugal. So, you know, we had already gotten our visa, we were preparing for a staff appointment over here, and we, our first task was to get our NIF. And so initially we were under the impression that we could get it ourselves for some reason. So we were doing our research, we were like ready to do it. And then we were like, oh, actually it doesn't seem like we can, we can do this without what's called a fiscal representative. So any foreigner, um, like non-EU resident basically needs a fiscal representative in Portugal to request a NIF on their behalf. And so we were like, okay, this is not too easy. We actually need someone to help us. So then we were trying to figure out like, you know, just doing some research online. Um, we were part of a handful of Facebook groups and seeing kind of like, what do people normally do? And it seemed like the standard at that time was that, you know, there would be threads and people would comment like, oh, reach out to this person, this person help me. Mm -hmm. um, and so we started reaching out to people, asking for price quotes, figuring out like, what is this actual process of getting a NIF, what's involved and all these things. And it was just like so opaque. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we talked to a handful of people, prices were all across the board, like all the way from like 50 euros to upwards of 800. And they were like, how is this a thing? Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, we ultimately were <laughs> pressed for time. So ended up hiring an agency to help us get our NIF. Um, like someone we had worked with before. And so we were able to get that done, um, pro like went through with, you know, the other requirements for a self appointment, did our self appointment. And then fast forward, so this is kind of like percolating. That was just like our experience. And mm -hmm. then later that year, we, we were thinking about it. Um, and we just had this idea where we were like, hey, you know how like all these people need to get those NIF? Uh, like all these people need to get their NIF. Why don't we create a website? work with some, you know, work with a, basically like find someone to be the fiscal mm. representative because we can't be people's fiscal representative. Um, so we're like basically find someone and then facilitate that whole process of collecting intake, processing payment, doing the customer support and just make it really easy. Like be transparent about like what's involved, how much things cost. Um, yeah. And put that out there. So we kind of, it was like really meant to be like a, a small experiment where we were like, mm -hmm. I don't know if people would find this helpful, but it would have been helpful to have if we, you know, like back when mm -hmm. we were going through it. So then we decided to launch it. Um, we wanted to, yeah, we basically just like made the website live, um, reached out to a few influencers on YouTube who create content on moving to Portugal. Cause you were like, who can we share with, share this with? And the response was really positive. A lot of the, influencers that we reached out to were like, Hey, a lot of my, like a lot of people are asking for the service. It's amazing that you created this. And then one thing kind of led to another and then, yeah. And then now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And are you still managing design stack as well? Or is that kind of gone to the side as you worked on this? Or obviously it sounded like you also had some other projects. So I don't know what you can share, but I'd be curious to hear where you kind of see all of this going for you uh, and your husband working together going forward. Yeah. So Border has grown quite a bit from the NIF. So like the NIF thing grew and then a lot of our customers are like, Hey, thanks so much for helping me get my NIF. I actually need to get my bank account. Um, turns out embassies, uh, a lot of the consulates were then requiring that people have bank accounts, funded bank accounts, even before coming to Portugal. So mm -hmm. then they were like, how do we manage this remotely where there isn't even an option to travel to Portugal because of COVID? Mm -hmm. um, and so we decided to take that on, eventually set up our bank account service. So anyway, Border has, has like really grown and ended up taking a lot of time. Uh, so, and it's really exciting because there's like so much opportunity um, and so much that we can do. And there are, there, there, I feel like in the past few years, Portugal has really increased in popularity and we do see a lot of people moving. Um, so I guess just to answer your question in terms of where DesignStack falls in this now, um, we have 
we've kind of put design stack on pause because I'm like the only designer mm-hmm. <laughs> in design right. stack. So now I'm um, focusing all of my energy on, on border and of course retreats as well. Nice. And so, yeah, just how do you kind of see Portugal evolving here as a destination for, of course, for nomads like you were at the time, but but more importantly, for people who want to settle down somewhere, especially in the EU, um, you know, it, how do you figure that it's gotten this prominence in the space? Even, you know, I felt like it wasn't even at the point that it was when I, uh, when we came here in 2019, you know, same kind of thinking that you had the same about the same time frame, And suddenly uh-huh. it seems like it's top of mind for everyone. So how do you think it's developed and, and where do you think it'll kind of go from here if you have any sense of it? Totally. Well, I think, I mean, you being here and me having been here for the two years, I, I can definitely see why it's so popular as as a place to live. Like the quality, quality of life is so good. The weather is gorgeous. I don't know how it's like 19 degrees in February <laughs> and yeah. like sunny and blue. Um, so it's like really like moderate climate, the people are so friendly, so warm. I think it's really expat friendly. That's like actually one of the most surprising Mm. things um, for me having moved here, like how easy it is to kind of just like integrate. Um, I'm learning Portuguese very slowly. Um, The level of English is like really high, especially in the bigger cities. But then even if you aren't able to communicate in, you know, even though you aren't able to communicate, the people are just like so friendly and warm and patient and welcoming, um, which is, which is so nice as a, as a foreigner moving to a new city. Um, the produce is good. The healthcare is good. I don't know. Like there are, of course it's not, it's like, you know, there you have to take that with a grain of salt. And of course, there are also cons. But I think generally, um, as a country, it's a very comfortable place to live in. And I can see why it's attractive, both for like retirees and remote workers alike. So it sounds like you've signed on to a long term lease there in Lisbon. Do you figure that you'll be here in Portugal for the foreseeable future? You know, what are your thoughts? And also, you know, do you have any of those, uh, I don't know, underlying motivations to get back out on the road more so uh, like you used to in the past? Or or are you pretty, you know, satisfied and, and settled here in Portugal? Yeah, Portugal is definitely home now. Um, so I do see us being here for the foreseeable future. I do miss traveling, I will mm. have to say. Um, the original intent was to spend like six to eight months in Portugal and then, you know, travel the rest of the time. Um, we both, Richard and I, have family in the U.S. and in Asia. Um, so being in Europe is kind of nice being right in the middle. And there's a lot of Europe that I'd still like to see kind of kind of going back to earlier where like we have there actually isn't much of we've been pretty limited in the time that we've been Mm -hmm. able to spend in europe um but definitely like you know those will be more of like week-long trips or two week-long trips while having lisbon as our home base for the next few years sounds good uh yeah definitely uh have the same feeling here about Porto, (laughs) and i look forward to more travel but at the same time very happy where we are now um i I was just wondering you know in in sort of conclusion if you had any final thoughts as far as people uh any advice that you'd give for people who want to try to you know maybe move to portugal or just to become a digital nomad and and maybe scratch that entrepreneurial itch that they have so if you have any last thoughts or advice we'd love to hear yeah, totally. So I guess for moving to Portugal, um, one thing after having like seen a lot of the country, there are so many different options based on what you're looking for. You know, you can have like the bigger city feel in Lisbon. You can have kind of like the smaller, like the smaller city feel in Porto, which feels like one big cool neighborhood. Um, you also have like the smaller villages if you're looking for more of like a, an escape from the city. So yeah, there's just like a lot. Portugal has a lot to offer. Um, So if you are curious about it, it would be great to kind of just like, I would recommend coming to Portugal, renting a car and just like seeing the country and seeing what options there are for you. If you're looking to start a business and curious to try, kind of just like jump into it. There really is no better way to learn how to run a business than than to learn through experience. Um, Of course, you don't have to quit your job and do everything. It could very much start with like, a small project that you're doing while you have your full-time job, or you can try your hand at like freelancing and, you know, starting by doing some projects for friends. Um, Mm -hmm. But anything that you can kind of do to like dip your toes into it. um, You never know how one thing leads to another. 
And I did have one other question, as you were saying before, back, I think 2016 or something, when you were thinking about starting as digital nomad or no, maybe it was 2018. Um, anyway, <laughs> when you were thinking about that and people were giving you kind of a strange look there in San Francisco, have you found that now there's those people that are in your network or that you otherwise knew in San Francisco or anywhere else around the world or the United States that are now thinking about trying to, you know, come to Portugal or to become digital nomad? Do you feel like the, the sentiment uh, and, and the view of this type of lifestyle has changed in the last few years? Totally, totally. And I feel like COVID has really accelerated that. Like, I think that like working remotely and like living abroad, having distributed teams is like really cool now, which is, which is amazing and exciting to see. Um, it is really like, we have had friends that have like come through and have told us that they're like considering, you know, there are a lot of programs now, like remote year and like mm -hmm. other, yeah, other structured programs that help people kind of like manage, manage the work and travel so that you don't have to like handle all the logistics. So it is, it is really cool to like see that evolve. Um, and I, and with COVID, like a lot of people left the big cities. So ironically, mm -hmm. a lot of our friends have actually left the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, most of them have like, you know, moved around within the U.S. Um, but yeah, I think we're definitely seeing that companies and individuals are are a lot more open and interested in in living and working abroad. <laughs> Nice. It sounds like you've been a good influence on them then. So happy to hear that. Um, yeah. In closing, I would love just to know how people can find out maybe more about you and what you're doing about Border, other projects that you have going on as well. I know that we'll share a link in our show notes for people to uh, make use of the Border service and get 10 euros off of their offer as well. So we'll definitely include that. But if you have any other places where people can uh, follow you and, and tra your travels and adventures, that would be great. Totally. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not very big on social media. So in terms of sharing like our adventures and personal, you know, personal journey, there isn't too much on that. Um, so I would say that Border is probably the best place. Our website is border.io. That's B-O-R-D-I.io. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we'll have that link in the show notes. Thanks so much again for sharing all of your insights and your experience. Look forward to seeing how things play out for you with Border and here in Portugal. Thanks again, David. It was so much fun. <laughs> My pleasure. Hey guys, don't forget to like our video, subscribe to our channel, and leave your comment below. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Expat Empire. We help people to move abroad through our personalized consulting services. For more information, check out expatempire.com. Thanks and see you soon.